And Didier Sonnet has worked on something very similar, but in different contexts, in, in social media contexts. So, for example, you can look at uh, YouTube views or book sales on Amazon. And here you see exactly the same distinction between endogenous jumps due to the you know, self-excitation of the system and exogenous jumps due to the interview of the author of the book. And so what you see is that exactly the same. You see profiles that are pretty flat before the jump and then relaxation after the jump in the ca case of a exogenous jump triggered by uh, real events, so to say. And, and you see a much more symmetric type of profile for um, endogenous events. For me, the best part of my podcasting journey has been the opportunity to speak to a huge range of extraordinary investors from all around the world. In this series, I've invited one of them, who also happens to be a longtime friend, namely Harry Krishnan, to host a series of in-depth conversation on the topics of volatility, risk, and portfolio protection. In today's world, portfolio construction is fast moving to the top of the agenda of many investors as they try to analyze and understand the riskiness of their portfolio. With ever-increasing uncertainty around the globe, knowing if you are essentially long or short volatility in your portfolio can mean the difference between ruin and survival when the next crisis emerge. The aim of these conversations is to try and understand the experiences that have influenced these highly specialized market participants and the processes they follow to harness their returns so that we can all become better informed investors. And with that, please welcome Harry Krishnan. Thank you very much, Niels, for the introduction. Uh, my guest today is Jean-Philippe Bouchot, founder and chairman of Capital Fund Management, adjunct professor at the École Normale Supérieure, and director of the CFM Imperial Institute of Quantitative Finance at Imperial College in London. I should add co-founder of CFM because it was founded by many people, uh, well, including Jean-Pierre Guidard, who passed away, but uh, CFM was really founded by Jean-Pierre Guidard in 91. And uh, the story uh, started a little later for me. Well, apologies for that, first of all. But um, in any case, I, I thought I'd start, given that you're um, coming to the hedge fund world with a very diverse background, maybe you could go back in time a bit and tell us about what area of physics you worked in and how you moved into finance. Sure. Well, I was really trained as, as a statistical physicist, which means uh, you know, things that are really useful to think about financial markets or economic systems as a whole. Um, you know, how does uh, macro behavior emerge from micro elements? Um, so how does uh, price emerge from the interaction between many traders? And how, how does economic cycles emerge from a lot of agents doing stuff in the economy. So, um, strangely enough, I, I've always been interested by financial time series, um, even before studying physics. And so, um, you know, it was very natural to me when, after my PhD in physics, and after a few years being a researcher, to get interested in the real stuff and try to get my hands on time series and play with them. I mean, in, in the 80s was really the time where uh, people got excited in things like dynamical systems and uh, prediction of chaotic systems and uh, fractals and anomalous diffusion and all these things. And and so the, the jump for me from uh, pure physics, to, uh, at least the physics I was doing, and, and, and financial time series was pretty obvious. I mean, it was uh, more or less the same thing. And actually... The trigger was uh, the 1987 crash and the fact that clearly um, Gaussian behavior and uh, you know, the normal Brownian motion was clearly out of whack. And, uh, and these uh, multi-scale phenomena resembling earthquakes and you know, scale-free um, uh, jumps of all sizes in financial market were so close to the topics I was excited about that uh, you know the move was was really obvious and actually the move was simultaneous to uh, many other physicists who started getting interested in finance at the same time yeah indeed i mean my f 
first knowledge of econophysics, I think, came from Stanley's group. Yeah, exactly. In Boston. And if I understood correctly, they just tabulated returns over different partition windows and looked at the scaling laws of that. And uh, there were lots of interesting results there, such as um, over very short horizons, tails tended to be fatter, even if normalized for volatility and so on. And um, I know you know much more about this than I do, but there were various people working in the area, including Didier Sonnet over time and, and others. But I am particularly interested in a paper that um, you wrote with several collaborators, including Julien, um, where you were investigating the um, endogeneity of large price moves, for lack of a better phrase. Um, I think you did it for individual stocks, and you were saying something to the effect that very an un unexpectedly large number of very large moves were not accompanied by obvious news events. Can you say something about that? And its significance? Yeah, I'm really happy you asked the question because actually we worked again on the same subject uh, a few months back and published another paper with um, essentially the same results, uh, but with, you know, 10 years more data um, and, and a little more elaborate uh, way of uh, looking at the data and fitting the data. And, and so, the, yes, so the surprising thing is that when you try to synchronize time series, so in the particular case we looked at, it's, um, I mean, the recent paper is 300 stocks for uh, several years at the one minute time scale. And so you can synchronize this um, uh, price time series with uh, the news feed and try to match uh, large moves defined as uh, four sigma events or six sigma events. I mean, things that shouldn't happen in a Gaussian world anyway. So things that are, you know, can be reasonably seen as large events with a volatility that's actually, you know, not a, an average volatility, but the, the local volatility. So we're trying already to account for uh, a local extra activity in the market. But with respect to this local causal volatility, there's still these huge jumps that happen a lot, actually. And, and, you know, without doing any statistics, the, the point is that it's clear that they happen much too often to be explained by news. There are not so many news concerning a company. Uh, you know, maybe there's one news a week or, or but, but there's not a news all the time concerning single companies. One quick question there. Sorry to interrupt. Sure. You mentioned normalization by local volatility. Where do you get that data and what does, what does that exactly oh, mean? Oh, we measure the, 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 so, you know, you, you have so a series of one-minute time returns, and so you can cook up your preferred uh, measure of past volatility over a window that's, in our case, a few hours causal back in time. And so it's essentially, say, the average value of the absolute value of one-minute time uh, price returns over the last 300 minutes. I mean, you know, I, I'm not sure about the exact numbers, but something like that. So if the market was already agitated, this is still, you know, an unexpected to have a four sigma event. Many people believe that if you normalize by, by vol, as, as you were uh, saying earlier, and this relates to the, the uh, very early Stanley papers, um, it's still non-Gaussian. You know, you can normalize the way you want. You, you're not going to capture all these tail events. And so, okay, so with respect to this local vol, you have these huge events and they don't seem to be explained by anything at all and it's not it's not even things that are market-wide or sector-wide you could think that maybe your stock jumps because it's related to oil or corn or whatever and then you would expect that the news you should look at is not on the uh, tagged with a company name but it's tagged with uh, oil or corn or something else but actually we can exclude these as well and, and so what we find is that the intraday jumps are to a large majority, I mean, <laughs> actually more than 90%, they're unrelated to, to news. And what's really interesting, I think, is that now you can zoom in the profile, the volatility profile or the trend profile before and after these jumps. So you kind of, uh, you know, move your time window such that T equals zero is the time of the jump 
And then you look at uh, the profile of vol or trends before and after this, this jump. And what you find is that this distinction between news-induced jumps and no news jumps um, makes sense at the level of the profile you observe. And, and what you see, and maybe it makes sense, maybe it's obvious, but that's what the empirical data shows, is that obviously for a news-related jump, the profile is completely flat before the news, or maybe sometimes there's a little agitation a few minutes before, maybe the news has leaked and, and has already creeped in uh, the volatility. And then there's a jump, so the jump is completely unexpected from that point of view. And then there's a relaxation of the volatility. You know, the market gets agitated and then calms down. And actually, it calms down pretty quickly. I mean, the decay can be fitted by the power law, something that's not exponential, but it's still pretty quick. Now, if you look at uh, the zoo of no news jumps, what you find is that they're uh, well fitted by something very different, which is much more symmetric. That is, volatility has increased before the jump and decreased after the jump. And the decay, which is a kind of mirror image of the increase, is much slower than for the news-driven jumps. You know, a kind of a, an intuitive way to, to tell the story is that it's as if markets, when there's a jump, because there's a news, the market knows why the, the price has jumped. So the relaxation of the volatility is, is kind of quick. Because so let, let, let me stop you very quickly sure. here. So if you hadn't found this difference, this qualitative difference in the rate of relaxation, wouldn't that have been raised the question that maybe you've just missed the news events to tag no, exactly. these large it, moves by? So that's a very significant result. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's difference. why we, we, we think it's important to see that the two categories of jumps are really statistically different. And by the way, it would it would be very strange that ninety percent of the jumps are not accompanied by a news in the Bloomberg newsfeed. I mean, come on! I mean, Bloomberg is supposed to be covering most of the relevant news for financial markets, so it would be really weird if we missed. So probably we 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 do miss a few news here and there, but um, we can't miss the majority of news that that I, I, I don't buy. But anyway, you really see something happening before the jump. Um, and then relaxation after the jump. And, and, and so what's also for me extremely exciting is that you mentioned the Didier Sornet earlier, um, and Didier Sornet has worked on something very similar, um, but in different contexts, in, in social media contexts. So, for example, you can look at uh, YouTube views or book sales on Amazon, and here you see exactly the same distinction between endogenous jumps due to the you know, self-excitation of the system and exogenous jumps due to the interview of the author, for example, um, of the book. And so what you see is that exactly the same. You see profiles that are pretty flat before the jump and then relaxation after the jump in the ca case of an exogenous jump you know, triggered by uh, real events, so to say. And, and you see a much more symmetric type of profile for um, endogenous events. And, and the logic is that, you know, the market or YouTube or all these social phenomena, which, of course, are common to markets and, and, and YouTube and so on, is that there's, there's a self-excited phase where, you know, there's, there's a random event that, triggers a little more activity and the, the activity feeds back on itself and, and it's growing, it's growing, it's growing. And at one point there's, there's a kind of blow up and then it relaxes. Um, whereas in the case of exogenous shocks, of course, there can't be anything before the, the jump and a relaxation after the jump. So qualitatively it looks the same, but what is even you know, more amazing uh, to me is that the actual shape of the profile is the same if you look at financial markets, if you look at Amazon book sales, if you look at YouTube uh, views. So it might be a coincidence, but for me, it indicates that 
there's probably something common in the way these social media, and you can, again, think of markets as a kind of social media, where information is transferred uh, and, and seen by everybody simultaneously, um, that can you know, account for, these, for the commonality of these results. So I have a kind of a boring technical question. How timely is the Bloomberg feed? I know it's quite timely, but if you're looking at one-minute partitions, um, is it timely enough? Yeah, I mean, we also scanned around the, the, the jump to see whether we were not missing something that was not synchronized exactly with the jump. So you look five minutes before and five minutes after the jump to be sure that you've not missed something that's trivial, that you know your, your clocks were not synchronized. And I guess I have to act as the sort of radio host in heavy quotes and say um, that in my view, this is very significant because endogenous effects suggest that um, people perhaps shouldn't be looking around to see what caused every large move on a given one day basis, let's say, but rather should be more concerned about positioning, leverage and other sorts of risks that can emerge from the system. Oh, yes. No, totally. I mean, one should add a few things about this story. One is that it's very similar, although I think much more precise, than to um, things that have been uh, understood in the past. For example, you know, the excess volatility puzzle of Schiller is the same thing. You know, there are things that you can't explain by fundamentals, and it's the same idea that there's kind of excess volatility. So in this case, it's really jumps, but jumps obviously contribute to volatility. So uh, it's it's really the same spirit. But even closer to our study is something that was published in, in the 80s by Cutler, Potaba, and Larry Summers. And the paper was called What Moves Prices? And what they did was exactly the same, um, but on a much coarser level. They looked at the 50 largest uh, S&P moves in the, in, since the war, I think. I, I don't remember exactly the time period. Um, so it's much less statistics, of course. It's only the S&P index and it's only one day, uh, daily news, the daily moves. And, and they tried, they really went back to the New York Times and looked at what was written in the New York Times to explain what happened. And, you know, the same thing is, you observe the same uh, phenomena. That is, a lot of jumps seem to be related to nothing at all. So the, the New York Times cooks up a story which doesn't mean anything. You know, people were looking for opportunity trades or, um, I mean, there was a minor story like 1987, which clearly was completely amplified by portfolio insurance and, and the feedback of black shoals on the market. Um, but the, the biggest news don't correspond to, uh, the, sorry, the biggest jumps don't correspond to big news. Of course, sometimes there's a news like Heisenauer uh, got a heart attack in, in the 50s, and this is going to move the market. So we're obviously not saying that important news like, I don't know, Pfizer um, announcing that they got the vaccine or or things like that, they actually move the pr prices very much. But th these are pretty rare events, actually. Uh, and, and you see markets jumping all the time. So the disconnect between the two, as I said, you don't even need to have statistics to, to feel that there is something wrong in the traditional picture. But our latest paper, I think, pins down much more precisely what's going on with these volatility profile. Um, exploding and relaxing after the jump. I'd like to jump into a different topic, which it has to result has something to do with variable timescales, and I hope it. I'm not asking too many questions in one, but it seems like there's been kind of a branching out in what may have been called econophysics, into very detailed microstructure studies about what's the, pri the shape of the price impact function um, and what's the relaxation if multiple trades are made and so on. And this kind of heuristic of agent-based modeling that's done by central banks, such as the Bank of England had written a few papers and Richard Bookstaber had written a book about it. Um, mm -hmm. 
what's the renormalization? What's the way to stitch together these two ideas? I know it's many, many questions in one, but do you have any sense as to how the micro actually maps to things that not the high frequency pros, but someone on the street can, can at least come to grips with? Yes, well, sure. I mean, of course, in your question, there's an extra comple- level of complexity, which is that there's, there are financial markets and this multi-scale phenomenon that you're talking about, but it also can feed, to the, to feed back to the economy. And, and you have these macro models that people are interested in to describe the economy as a whole. And so, you know, trying to tie together how financial markets and and real the real economy, as people say, m- merge together is, is an extra level of complexity. So if you just restrict your question to how do you go from micro scales to macro scales in financial markets, um, I think it's, it, it's an extremely interesting question. And um, it's, to me, there's been uh, an exciting development recently, which is this inelastic market hypothesis of uh, Gabex and Cosian. Yes, yes. Yeah, which um, so so they come up with a story which is something that you know we at CFM have, have always 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 believed in, um, which is that what people do actually impacts prices and impacts prices at, at the short run, but also on the long run. And so, um, well, if you want, it's uh, again related to the excess volatility problem and, and the jump, uh, endogenous jumps. It's, uh, it's, it's not because something happens in the real world that markets change, it's because people do things for whatever reason. I mean, for, you know, fake information that they believe they have or or, or need for cash or whatever, um, this is going to impact prices. And what we are seeing is is these, the superposition of all these impact um, um, effect that that people have on on markets. And I think it's it's a it's a very important way to think about what's going on in markets, both for trading purposes, for imagining trading strategies, but also. If you take the point of view of regulators, um, uh, you know, how if you want to stabilize markets, whatever that means, you have to think that there's a lot of things happening in markets that is not due to fundamentals, and and that you know there's an engineering problem that is how do you avoid these these jumps that we talked about, for example. Anyway, coming back to your precise question, um, so you know, at CFM we've been. Um, studying what you talked about, this uh, impact of trades at the micro scale, let's say between a few minutes and a few days. And here we understand pretty well what's going on. There's this the whole uh, story of square root impact and, and this is actually a huge effect. Um, even if you trade relatively small quantities, you impact markets uh, a lot. I mean, the, the square root law tells you that even if you trade one percent of the average daily volume, you impact prices by ten percent of their own volatility. So it's it's really uh, major, and it's major because there's a, a associated costs to to that impact. But then, of course, the question is, what does it have to do with the macro scale, with the long time scales, and what? How does it? Um, relate to Gabe and Cohesion's story, uh, who are more interested in, in the quarterly or, 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 or annually uh, price changes, annual price changes. And, and so what happens is that there's the square root impact on short time scales, that's huge. And then when you stop trading, impact relaxes. And it relaxes pretty slowly, but the, the question is, is it going to relax to zero? Or is it going to relax to a finite value? So even if you have um, no information, if you trade for random reasons, are you going to leave a trace in markets on very long time scale? And we always believe that this was true, but never really thought of how to quantify it. And then Cabex and Cohesion came with this uh, in, in, in elastic market hypothesis, and they actually tried to measure this long-term impact. And what they find and I think it's a surprise for most economists, is that, uh, so they have a very clever way to try to extract this purely random uh, effect on prices. So 
if you want, separating uh, price moving for because of kind of real information and prices moving for uh, random trades uh, impact. And what they find is that the the effect is is not as huge as the short term square root thing, but it's still very large. And the way they frame it is that if you buy one dollar of a stock, five to one rule, yes, yeah, five to one for the index, and one to one for individual stocks. And and so if you buy one dollar of a stock, you raise its market cap by one dollar, and and vice versa if you sell. And so it's 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 you know it's pretty major and it's, it's uh, amusingly they've um, also done a, um, a survey and asked economists you know this multiplier uh, how how much do you think it is and what they find is that the median uh, median answer is zero and the average answer is point oh one yes. so a hundred times smaller than the actual effect and so what. What we, what I did actually during the summer was to um, think again about our theory about the square root impact, and then I realized that we had done a calculation that I didn't really understand. That I mean, I didn't understand how important it was at the time, and I didn't try to make the order of magnitude. And and, and so what we had done was to compute, have a, a kind of microscopic theory to understand the square root impact. But then we also can compute within the same model the decay, and the asymptotic value. And when you put reasonable numbers for what the theory uh, predicts, you find something of order one as well. And what is interesting is that, you know, it's of order one for non-trivial reasons. It's of order one because it's the ratio of two small numbers. And so it has no reason a priori to be one, but it happens that it's essentially the ratio of the volatility per day which is 0.01, 1% per day or 2% per day, to the volume traded divided by the market cap. And we know that the volume traded on a given stock is 0.5% of the market cap daily. That's a that's you know, rough order of magnitude. And so, you know, you should add a few prefactors here, but essentially it's 2% divided by 0.5%, which is four. So, okay, so it's a number of order one. And that's, that's what's important in, in the theory. And and uh, so I think everything matches together pretty nicely. And I hope I've answered your question because I think it's this is really the point. How do you go to, from high, fre a high frequency phenomenon, which is this square root impact, which has been extremely well documented in the literature since uh, I don't know in the nineties? Actually, Barra have papers on that already. And and this very long term part of the impact. I mean, long term. I'm not speaking about 10 years. I don't know what happens you know, uh, on very, very long term. But at least for medium terms, which is a few months to, to I, I think, one or two years, um, you have this huge multiplier, which I think is just a trace of this square root impact that hasn't decayed to zero. Okay, I have two questions here. Very different. One is more technical, and I'll quickly buzz through that. There has been a little bit of work done using dimensional analysis to figure out what the impact function should be. So in other words, if the price process is a Brownian motion and a volatility scale, scales as the square root of time, then the impact function should be a square root function and so on. Do you believe this research? That's technical question one. Well, yes, actually. It, but dimensional analysis assumes that you've listed all the dimensional quantities that the impact can depend on. And I, I'm going to answer your question very precisely because this is exactly what comes out of my analysis. So if you assume that there's no time scale, no intrinsic time scale, then indeed you can only have a square root impact because essentially volatility is one over square root of time and and volume per unit time is one over time. So the, the only way to get rid of time is to have a square root impact. But now if, and, and that's what our microscopic theory of square root impact uh, suggests, if there's a memory time in the market, which, which exists, and, and the, the story here is that, you know, I mean, our picture of, of this inelastic market hypothesis is that People don't know where the price is. I mean, nobody knows where the fundamental value of the price is. And so 
you know, people believe uh, uh, in a level of the price instantaneously. You know, they wake up in the morning and say, yeah, okay, the price should be around here. But then the, the price moves around. And so some people still believe that the price in yesterday morning or yesterday is, is the correct reference price. But slowly, they're going to forget what was the reference price. And, and they're going to adapt their reference price to the current price. So there's, there's a, you know, the, the market loses memory of, of what was the reference price before because nobody can believe he has the truth and he's, everybody has to adapt his or her reservation price to whatever the price is now. Um, and, and so if you believe that people have a very strong opinion about the price and, and never change this opinion, then impact will decay to zero. But if you believe that the memory of the market is going to be a finite time, and, and from you know, our measurements, we can estimate this to be a few, a few days or a few weeks, you know, say two weeks maybe, which is reasonable. It's hard to believe that um, the reference price can survive much longer than that. Then, you know, you have a, a, an intrinsic time scale that comes out, and then the dimensional analysis allows you to do something else. And, you know, from um, general arguments, and it turns out that the theory is compatible with these general arguments, you have to have now a linear, not square root, dependence on the traded volume. And, and because you have this square root of time, of this memory time that you can play with, then you can cook up a formula that is still dimensionally correct, but includes this, this square root of memory time. And so that's, that's you know, how you can escape the, the, the square root law from dimensional argument and find something else. It's because there's an extra time that is involved in the problem. And if this extra time was infinite, then the impact would be zero. Then the, the relaxation would, would go to zero. So uh, you know, I think it makes a lot of sense that if you want to reframe it another way, if people really strongly believe in, in the notion of fundamental uh, price that would persist forever until there's a news, then indeed pr the price should decay back to its initial value. Because they, they, yeah. yeah. But if people don't know and you know, do a kind of tatonement and don't know exactly what the price is and update their, um, their belief, then... Uh, then, as I said, you have a, a memory time that, that um, Gross. kicks in the problem and it allows you to do much more than just the square root impact. Very good. And, I, and the more practical question, um, again, I have to bring it back to the audience, is um, do you think that the inelastic market hypothesis was at least partly driven by flows into passive vehicles? You know, in other words, Flows that aren't value-oriented, even if value is some arbitrary metric, but just where an index is cast in stone and when a dollar goes into the index, it has to be invested in proportion to the index weights. Is that, is that something underpinning this? And have you noticed a difference in market dynamics, at least over short timescales, based on the accelerated flows into passive? No. I don't think that's the right story, actually, um, for different reasons. One is that I believe that this um, uh, square root law, and we, we have actually data dating back from, uh, our own data dates back from the early 2000s, and there's a lot of other data. Um, as I mentioned, there's uh, there's the, the BARA data from the 90s, and, and not only that, but also the square root law is... Um, extremely stable over time. So if you look at the, um, the coefficient in terms of square root law, so, so in order to be a little more precise, the impact that you have on short time scales is the volatility of the, of the thing you're trading times the square root of the volume you trade over the volume of the market. And then there's a, 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 a dimensional coefficient, a pure number in front of that. And this pure number is, say, 0.5. And if you measure this number, uh, uh, well, from our own trades on many different assets, 
it's a pretty constant number over time. So volatility changes, volume trade changes, but the coefficient you need to put in front of this uh, formula is an incredibly robust and doesn't change over time. Doesn't change much. I mean, there's, of course, um, uh, measurement noise. But furthermore, what you observe is that this square root uh, thing is true whether you look at you know, individual stocks, uh, futures, futures on whatever you want, commodities, bonds, um, foreign exchange. Uh, you can look at volatility itself. You can look at the impact of Vega trading on implied vol, and you find exactly the same square root with the correct prefactors. Um, so and you can even look at that on Bitcoin. I have a PhD student, Jonathan Donier, who actually got his hands on 2012 data on, on Bitcoin. And there's a beautiful square root law as well there. So you know, I think this square root story is totally independent of passive flows and whatever. And now if you believe in, in my story that when the square root relaxes back to zero, well, relaxes back to something and, uh, and that this something is uh, related to the memory time of the market, I think that the only thing that the a passive flow may have changed is this memory time of the market. But um, it's very difficult to measure. Uh, you know, we, one should maybe redo the GABEX cohesion analysis uh, over you know, different decades, maybe the 90s, the 2000s, 2010s, and see what happens. But my gut feeling is that um, because the, the final, I mean, at least in my formulation, because the final formula that only depends on the square root of this memory time, uh, you can change it a little bit. It won't change a lot the, the final result. So that's that's my but, feeling that you know the, this um, inelastic market hypothesis is not only true for single stocks or for indices. It's is going to be true, whatever the, the, the yeah whatever the, the the financial assets you're you're looking at. I have one other question about the passive. Um investing thing. Um, I, I don't have skin in the game, just so that that's clear. In terms of price impact, you know, you see things, say, in the US where the fangs have become bigger and bigger and bigger. And so they're the biggest stocks by market cap in, say, the S&P. Uh, is it true or is it false that if um, one stock is 10 times bigger than another stock and it gets 10 times the dollar allocation, that the price impact will be the same. Is there any law or any known um, heuristic in that regard? Because a lot of people are out there arguing that, oh, uh, Apple, if it gets 10 times the allocation of a smaller stock, will actually move more. So that is responsible for the rise in the relative um, size of Apple in the index. Well, you know, it depends when you say, is it false or, or is it true? It's, uh, it's, it's a question, again, one should separate what is short-term impact or long-term impact. Short-term, the, the, the answer is definitely that the formula where you input the volatility of what you're looking at times the square root of the volume divided by the market volume, this is true, you know, independently of, that's the beauty, it's independent of the stock you're looking at. So if the stock is higher volatility and lower traded volume for a given dollar amount, you're going to move it more. And if it has lower volatility and higher uh, traded volume, you're going to move it less, which I guess is kind of intuitive. Now the question is what happens, you know, for this long-term impact thing, the GABX equation uh, uh, multiplier. And I think at this stage, um, it's difficult to say, although uh, Philippe van der Beek in uh, Lausanne has uh, a recent paper where he tried to measure this multiplier uh, depending on market cap. Or, uh, and then there's my, 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 my theory, if you want, that actually, surprisingly, if you look at the, this object, which is the... the the ratio of the volatility divided by the ratio, I mean, volatility divided by the ratio of, of uh, traded volume over market cap. This is surprisingly constant 
over the whole spectrum of uh, uh, of stocks in the U.S. So I, I have a plot in my paper where I sh I was really surprised to see that I, I never realized that that it was so constant. So okay, at this stage, I think that more work is needed to um, answer precisely your question. This is all fine. Um, now I've been told, and I've failed miserably, that I should always start with easy stuff and then go into the technical material. But I'm going the back. I'm going backwards today. <laughs> so I would like to ask a bit about CFM. I know that uh, you've mentioned um, JP Aguiar on several occasions. Uh, just if you could tell us a little bit about him and how you worked with him and how Science Finance became somehow became merged with CFM. That would be lovely. Sure. Um, so that was in the 90s. Jean-Pierre Aguilar was a, a, an engineer, um, computer engineer, actually. And uh, he launched the, the first French um, trend follower, if you want. But in 91, having a, a trend follower, systematic trend follower on a variety of different instruments, of futures at the time, but uh, still a very diversified pool of futures was pretty new. And um, and so in this sense, he was clearly a pioneer. Um, and so between 91 and 94, he essentially you know, did the models himself. And then we accidentally met. Um, so that was That's the beauty of life is that sometimes you meet the right people at the right time. And um, he felt that he, he needed to muscle his research team um, at the time. And so it was a kind of love at first sight thing. We, we just, you know, we became, you know, friends and had a, both a business and intellectual proximity that um, allowed us to create science and, science and finance first, which was the research arm of CFM. And then the two companies merged together in, in, in 2000s, in, in 2000. Were you already working on, um, uh, I guess you'd call it random matrix theory at the time? Were you already looking at correlation matrices in some way? Sure. I mean, I think our first paper with uh, Mark Potters and Laurent Lalou probably dates back from 97 or something like that. So pretty early on, yeah. And uh, I know you can't give away anything, but how much edge has that given you in Stadarb, let's say, having a better correlation matrix, how much does that help you? I think it does. It, it, it really something is, well, you know, thinking, random matrix theory is, um, is interesting because as often in, in this world, um, you have the pure theory on the one hand and the, the use you make of it. And I think it, in this case, as in other cases, when you have a good theory, it allows you to um, have a better intuition of what you should measure and what you should do. And so I think it, thinking in terms of, of, of modes, as we call them, I mean, eigenvectors of these, of these matrices, allowed us over the years to have... Uh, a much better intuition of what we're doing when we're dealing with large portfolios. So clearly, we've used random matrix theory from the very start of our startup in 2001. And it has improved over time. Uh, the, the, the procedure to um, clean um, the, the, the covariance matrix and add more and more information to control the risk and so I'm sure that other people do it differently and, um, and maybe have other recipes that suit their purposes. And, and of course, there's the Barra factor model. That's another way to um, account for these correlations. But um, we've been very happy with our own implementation of that over the years, especially you know, with better and better understanding of the theory, in particular, a, a theoretical break, breakthrough in, in 2011. 11. Um, and so it's a never ending story in a way that um, uh, the more you think about the problem, the better tools you create and the better, uh, better way to understand, for example, you know, what's clearly different between theory and application is that um, financial markets are non stationary. 
So you cannot use covariance matrices from 100 years ago to uh, calibrate your risk model now. I mean, it wouldn't make any sense at all. In this case, you know, stocks that we deal with today didn't even exist. But barring that trivial effect, we expect that you know, the, the life of companies is such that you expect correlations between them to vary over time as well. And what's interesting is that random matrix theory also gives you precise tools to uh, separate what is um, measurement noise and what is true evolution of, of these covariance matrices. And I think this is really something important that we've been able to include in our model uh, early on. And how, how does it do that at a very rough level? Well, it allows you to set up um, uh, null hypothesis models, if you want. So, so the, the trouble with large covariance matrices is that you need a lot of data. Even if the you know, even market was stationary, you would need an enormous amount of data to correctly estimate a large covariance matrix. So the rule of thumb is that if you have um, n stocks or n assets, and n is like a thousand. So. N squared over. Sorry? Sorry. Order n, you need order n squared. Um, you have order n squared elements well, to estimate. Yes, you have over n squared elements and you have n times t data points. And so t is to be much larger than n. So the ratio is, is really n over t, t being the number of measurement points. I mean, the, the number of Date, the, the date, dates in your data point in your data time series, um, but the problem is that it is even worse. Is that what hap What comes in is not this ratio n over t; is the square root of this ratio. So even if you have a hundred times more dates than you have stocks, which is already a big stretch, because um, uh, you know if you have a thousand stocks, you need a hundred times a thousand days, which um, means that you're talking about like 400 years, which uh, uh, doesn't make sense. But even if you had that, the square root of the ratio would still be 0.1. So you would still have a 10% residual error that irreducible. So if you want to drive this error back down to 1%, you would need 10,000 more points, data date points than you have stocks. So it's just impossible. I mean, just forget it. But the the point is that in finance, there's a, a double whammy in a way that not only this statistical problem is around, but but you also expect that things change all the time, and that you know maybe the covariance matrix is kind of stable over two or three years, and then it's going to change. But you're never going to have enough data on the three-year timescale to really you know, pin down, I mean, a priori, this is uh, the, the, the thing that you might intuitively, intuitively think if you don't have these random matrix theory tools. And then when you drill down, you realize that um, you, you actually have a, a baseline hypothesis that the underlying covariance matrix that you cannot measure, but if you believe it exists and is stable, um, then you, they are clear predictions on the way the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix, of the empirical co covariance matrix should behave, and you can test that. So, you know, if you, if you test that the eigenvectors mm. are not behaving the way you would expect if the underlying covariance matrix was stable, then you have a, a signal that something um, uh, real is going on in your system. And the beauty of it I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to be technical here, but the beauty of it is that you don't even need to know the true covariance matrix to set up this test. And that's, that's really the beauty. Because, of course, if you needed to know the covariance matrix that you can never know anyway, um, the test would be useless. But the kind of magic of these um, large dimension problems that you know we now are in the large dimension everywhere we look at because machine learning is all about large dimensions and we have a very bad intuition of what happens in high dimensions so that's why we don't really understand why 
machine learning works uh, at, at present. And, but th there are also kind of miracles that happen in, uh, in the high dimension limit, uh, you know, similar in a way to central limit theorems, but much more elaborate, that allow you to get this amazing result that you can test whether the covariance matrix of a system is stable over time or not without even knowing what this covariance matrix is. What the true matrix yeah. is, yeah, exactly. But jumping to more general points, uh, do you still do trend following? And if you do, how do you do it differently from a standard trend follower? I know that much of the audience will be interested in, in your answer to that. Well... Okay, yes, we, we have, um, so we have different funds, but we have uh, in particular two explicit trend following funds. Um, and, uh, and, and one is uh, beta hatched um, uh, trend following. So we're trying to, to not to take um, uh, positive exposure to, to markets. Um, and the other one is, is, is not beta constrained, but We've tried to put everything we know about markets in this um, trend following uh, thing. In particular, try to choose the time scales in such a way that uh, trading costs are as, as small as possible and including everything we know um, on, on trends, which means uh, trends can be just price driven, but it can be also um, cross asset and it, cause, it can also have uh, fundamental trend uh, components. So there are different ways to implement uh, trend following. So I don't exactly know what other people are doing, of, of course, but, um, but we're trying to do our best to, you know, include in these trend following funds uh, everything we've understood uh, since CFM is CFM. We've been doing trend following since, since 91, you know. One small question there. If you kill the beta in a trend following program, do you lose the convexity? If there is convexity in trend following, do you lose it? Uh, so the extra you know, twist is to add explicit convex back convexity uh, by having short-term trends and, and, and VIX uh, trading as well. So you, you try to catch uh, extra convexity with a, a small layer of faster moving indicators. Uh, what's the relation between higher frequency momentum systems and volatility. Do you have a strong view on that or any, anything you've found that you can tell us about? Uh, what do you mean exactly? Uh, let's say I had two breakout systems in a bunch of markets. One of them trades 30-day breakouts and one trades two-day breakouts. Statistically, I would assume that the two-day breakout system has a higher correlation with realized volatility uh, across markets, cross-sectionally, than the 30-day one or the 100-day one. Yeah, sure. But do you have anything deeper you can say about that? Not really, no. No, I, I don't think I have anything specific to say about this. But you did mention that the shorter term systems gave you, supplied some of the convexity that may have been lacking in the hedge. Sure. Well, I, okay, so I, I don't exactly know what you have in mind, but what, what I'm trying to say is that we know that convexity is on the timescale of the trend itself. So if you want to get exposure uh, to, I mean, uh, avoid getting trapped in, in quick turnarounds of the market, then you have to have a, a shorter time uh, scale uh, in your system. Understood. Okay. Is there anything you'd like to add? I, I know I've kept you up very late. No, no, that's okay. Um, well, I'm really happy to have been able to speak about pretty technical things. I, I wasn't sure what to expect from the from the conversation, so it's been fun. No, I mean, you know, we can we could continue for, for, for forever speaking about different things. Um, maybe something that we've uh, touched upon without going very deep is um, what what we discussed when we discuss different time scales um, uh, going from the micro scale to the macro scale and I told you okay I can tell you what happens if you only focus on financial markets but then if you're really interested in macroeconomic phenomena 
and not only uh, financial markets, then there's still this missing link between the two. And I, I think that all this work on agent-based models, and in particular trying to set up agent-based models for macroeconomic systems and understanding things like, you know, why do we have inflation now? Why, why would standard models used by central banks been so blind um, for the 2008 crisis. We know that, but now again, it seems that people are caught off guard and didn't really imagine that inflation was uh, something that was coming. It's really surprising if you think about it. Um, I think we should do much better. And, uh, and so that's one part in which uh, CFM is trying to invest in terms of intellectual research um well what's the what's the strategy there you build a model that is suggestive of what the central bank is probably doing or using and then you look at the feedback between that and no 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 real it, fluctuations in asset prices or something like this no we're trying to have a, a model of the economy you know that that oh, tries a to model. yeah a try, better model yeah a better model of the economy that includes central banks possibly but that tries to identify feedback loops that may um, explain, for example, why uh, you have COVID, um, people um, are out of, uh, I mean, can't produce and can't uh, consume, so there's a drop of supply and demand, but then uh, central banks prop up the economy and try to keep people uh, afloat, and then the economy recovers, and what's going to happen after that? And so... It's really the standard approach. I mean, I shouldn't say standard, but the, the standard questions that you want to answer about the economy, what is going to happen in particular in terms of inflation. And and so my belief is that um, agent-based models are, are are going to be, I mean, of course, it has already started. You mentioned the Bank of England and and uh, Bookstaber and, and a lot of people, but we've been also John, involved. John Farmer. John Farmer, of course. And, and he's, published really interesting papers recently on, on the COVID crisis. Uh, but my, my feeling is that there's, there's a new science of agent-based models that needs to be built because uh, it's still at the very preliminary stage in my mind. I mean, there's a lot of things that... So you don't think the brute force methods of, say, the Billion Prices project? Oh, yes, sure. It's great. I mean, it, but this is more an input of agent-based models than, yeah, than an output. Exactly. And then that's exactly why that's where I'm heading at, exactly. is I think that the problem or maybe the strength of agent-based models is that you need a lot of data to calibrate them. And we will get all this data in the coming years, uh, billion price project being one example. But beyond calibration, I think uh, agent-based models really open up your mind to scenarios. And that's been something that I've tried to sell uh, in the in the recent months, is that maybe we should think more about these agent-based models, not necessarily in terms of purely quantitative methods, but rather qualitative ways to imagine things, imagine black swans, if you want, imagine things that are hard to imagine without the correct tool. And, and agent-based models are great because you, you, know, you, 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 you input relatively simple rules and what comes out of these rules is surprising. You know, even if you're like playing God and creating the world at your uh, at your will, what comes out of these rules is genuinely surprising, and and you're caught off guard by your own model. And I think this is really genuinely interesting from an intellectual point of view because it forces you to think about mechanisms and identify feedback loops that you hadn't thought about at first. And these feedback loops may be actually present in the real economy. And so, you know, to paraphrase um, Mark Buchanan, who's a, um, a scientific journalist uh, who wrote several books, maybe you, you know him. Uh, he's regularly writing in Bloomberg, actually. And, and so he described agent-based models as telescopes for the mind and enhancing our powers of imagination like telescopes enhance our powers of vision. And I think this is really the point. This is precisely um, right on. I'll make two quick comments about that. One is I do recall you're writing that risk management 
disasters were a failure of the imagination. Uh, so I'll quote you on that one. The second one is, I would have thought that the core problem, conceptual problem would be to relate um, flushing out of the order book at microstructure scales to fire sales research. There's a lot of research on fire sales. That's a pretty constrained problem. And uh, uh, short-term liquidations is a fairly well-defined problem. Some interpolation of those two would be of great interest. I'm just curious on your view of that. No, no, I agree. I, I mean, this is this is a micro, in, in a sense, it's a small, it's a toy model of of more important market failures. But uh, but I think, yeah, th these are probably much easier cases uh, to test these agent based models uh, compared to you know if you really want to have a go at macroeconomic problems. In any case, uh, it has been a pleasure, great pleasure. I'm. I hope the audience enjoys it. I enjoyed this greatly, and with that. I will hand it back to Niels. Thank you so much, Harry and Jean-Philippe, for a great conversation. I really enjoyed hearing about your views on whether or not news drive price action and large moves, and of course, how we should think about adapting to changing dynamics, such as correlations, which is a big challenge for systematic investors. Make sure you go and follow Jean-Philippe and Harry's work, because as you can tell from today's conversation, there are many facets to proper portfolio construction and we really look forward to exploring many more of them as our series continue from harry and me thanks so much for listening and we look forward to being back with you on the next episode and in the meantime take care of yourself and take care of each other thanks for listening to top traders unplugged If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.